I kill where I wish and none dare resist. I laid low the warriors of old and their like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender. Now I am old and strong. 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 My armor is like tenfold shields. My teeth are swords. My claws spears. The shock of my tail a thunderbolt. My wings are hurricane. And my breath death smog. The hobbit dragons are an obscure mythical creature that you've probably never heard of before. They're found all around the world. Although this is admittedly more due to decisions on the part of early translators than anything else. Hey Jack. What should we designate as the translation of Kitsakalatl? The feathery serpent thing from Mesa America I don't know. Dragon. Possibly inspired by various sources such as giant lizards such as Viranids, crocodilians and serpents. But also dinosaur bones and simple tall tales from travelers in distant lands. Dragons are often portrayed as keepers of vast hordes of treasure, which they accumulate over their very long lifespan and guard covetously. In western mythology, this is often an extension of their use as a metaphor for royal power, or for capitalism in modern works, though it's worth noting that a capitalist lizard in a sea of medieval feudal humans would actually be the most progressive one around. They can often fly and breathe fire or poison. Because of their majestic, fantastic nature dragons are a staple of much fantasy fiction and games. One of the most well known dragons is Smog from Tolkien's The Hobbit. The vast majority of later portrayals of dragons in fiction were based on Smog, who in turn had been inspired by the dragon Fafner, from the Valsunga saga and the dragon from Beowulf. In modern days dragons, being pretty much the, the logo of fantasy as a genre, have a wide variety of natures and depictions. Some are as smart as, if not smarter than, humans. Some are no smarter than an iguana. Some are inherently magical. Some not. Some are good. Some are evil, some neutral, basically, go nuts. A surprisingly common feature of dragons in fantasy is the dragon rider, a warrior who, well, rides a dragon. This frequently has two justifications besides awesome. For an intelligent dragon, they offer a slight, but non-trivial edge in combat, spotting threats early, and possibly giving you a new attack if they have a weapon that's effective versus other dragons at a slight to moderate cost in extreme flight maneuvers. For unintelligent dragons, being able to field them at all in war. Mythology. Classical. There are a bunch of monsters that might be referred to as a dragon by modern readers. Among them are Arapop of Egypt, various beasts from Mesopotamian myths, the Greek Hydra, and the Jewish Leviathan. The fact that so many different cultures across such vast gulfs of time and space all come up with the same general idea of what a dragon is, has generally be attributed to dinosaur fossils which appear all over the earth, or simply scaling lizards and crocodiles up. As for the unusual traits, some of those go way back. Such the Leviathan from Jewish tradition has heat breath attributed to, particularly in scripture and their origins are harder to discern. Medieval times. In medieval lore, the most important dragon story is that of Saint George and the Dragon. Most depictions of dragons descend in some way from it, either directly, or by imitating something that imitated it, especially its generally monstrous character due to a demanding tribute in the form of hot chicks. A few other noteworthy dragons in western literature include the final antagonist in Beowulf the first recorded fire-breathing dragon, as well as Fafner, noted for his intense greed and cursed golden horde. Special mention needs to go to the Slavs however, since their dragons had greater penchants for benevolence than those of other European nations and Bulgarian folk legends outright have dragons getting it on with humans. Asia. Asian dragons are typically long. In fact the chin's word for dragon is literally just long, pronounced exactly like the English word long, all by pure coincidence, snake-like creatures, and are generally less malevolent than their European counterparts. They tend to be associated with water rather than fire. At least one Chinese creator goddess appeared as a hybrid of woman and dragon. Whilst there are Japanese stories of noblemen marrying female dragons, they don't usually have wings. Flight being accomplished either by magic or riding the wind. Should be noted that in most Asian mythology, 
dragons are usually depicted as divine beings more on the side of good than evil. Not too many stories about dragon slang over here. That said there are a handful of tales of individual longs being less than ideal heavenly citizens. Journey to the West, for example, has a brief moment where a long is arrested for aiding a trio of conmen. Elsewhere, aside from broadly eastern and western dragons, there are other creatures and outliers that don't usually get the amount of attention the former categories do. Among them are Quetzalcoatl Nahuatl, a Mesoamerican deity whose name means feathered serpent. He was a god of wind, air and knowledge. Though depicted as an anthropomorphic figure, his name and general form could classify him as an equivalent of a dragon. For some reason, the Japanese keep depicting Quetzalcoatl in various anime as a blonde haired big titty woman, though at least one of those depictions is an Amazon luchadora, Appa, a giant serpent demon who resides in the do it, the Egyptian underworld, could be considered a whim more than a true dragon, Vitra, Vitra, another giant serpent, this time form in Devaders, there is also this Varupa, or three headed variant, Usum Galu, Usham Galu, a Mesopotamian lion dragon demon. They often accompanied kings in ancient Sumerian myths. Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons are one of the main selling points of the Dungeons and Dragons game, to the point that the 4th edition and 5th edition include a draconian race called Dragonborn, intended for players who want to look like a dragon. Dragon kind and half dragons are basically the confirmation of the rule that dragons, and or humans, can mate with anything, taking their place among the races often referred to as slut races. Humans, fiends, celestials, dryads, slutty, moderns, inevitables, formians and gribbly abominations from the far realm. We now permit you to take a break to use the brain oxy clean provided to you by Billy May's ghost to scrub any mental images you may have of a human. Dragon. Angel. Bela, Black Slard, Formian Queen or oh sweet merciful god emperor the mental image. True dragons, meanwhile, come in all shapes and sizes, from the evil chromatic to the good metallic. The psionic gem dragons, elemental dragons, planar line dragons, one for each outer plane except Arcadia, where dragons are hated, astral dragons, disaster dragons and even the potent and rare time dragons who are amongst the most dangerous creatures in existence. There are also dragon riders. That's to be taken literally in the overwhelming majority of cases. Just in case you didn't use enough brain bleach just 5 nanoseconds ago. They're really just pussy knights that stay safe just pointing the dragon in the right direction and let it fight for them. Occasionally dismounting to deliver a finishing blow or give a pompous bullshit speech. Except for viking dragon riders. Hardcore shit right there, though it's important to remember that these are rare in D&D. As everyone in this world, dragons themselves especially, will point out that a human having a pet dragon is like a fly having a pet human. This said, if you read what required said brain bleach above, the other kind of ride does happen occasionally as well. Half dragons wouldn't exist otherwise. As of 5e. It has been pushed dragons are divine on par with angels and demons on top of being engines of bringers of death and super geniuses. Fisban's treasury of dragons establishes that they have the strongest connection over the prime material plane. On their own ancient accounts that the prime was their home first before the gods busted in, Bahamut and Shamut being ripconned into very godlike primordial beings native to the prime material rather than the afterlives seeded their half-outsider creations in it, humanoids, and then broke the plane into parallel universes. This is an explanation of how dragons have multiple versions of themselves, plus copies of objects and dungeons relating to dragons appear in multiple planes and can develop dragon sight to interact with them. Dragons gain vast power from their hordes, with their presence and death to reshape the landscape and inhabitants to their draconic likings. In the end, this is all just extra flavor for DM you could ignore like the blood war, and give a lore excuse to that guy why the their character are going through white plume mountain is in a dark sun game with Niv Mizzet waiting at the end. Interestingly, the same book also offers DMS the idea that dragons in their particular world could procreate in methods more exotic than the standard one, such as their eggs forming naturally in volcanoes, gem deposits, or veins. 
etc. Kinds of dragons. There's a boatload of dragons in D&D. Many of them fit into the following groups. Chromatic dragons. The original dragons. Coming in a variety of colors. They are all some variety of evil and are the children of the dragon goddess Shyamut. In order of power white, black, green, blue and red are the five most common colors. But others include yellow, brown, purple and a whole rainbow of other colors. Metallic dragons. Starting out with only the gold dragon. In later editions they became linked to Bahamut, the god of good dragons. The most common ones are brass, copper, bronze, silver and gold in order of power, with others including iron, steel and adamantine. Ferrous dragons, a subgroup of the metallic dragons. Ferrous dragons are made of base metals instead of the noble ones. Gem dragons, adorned with crystal scales. The gem dragons have potent psionics and are usually also the go to neutral dragons to the metallics good and chromatics evil. Catastrophic dragons. Introduced in 4e, these dragons have been infused with elemental power by the primordials to make them look like elemental dragons. Planar dragons. Dragons linked to the various planes of existence. Frequently the outer planes of plan escape. All of said outer planes have their own kind of dragon. Except for Arcadia where dragons are despised. Oriental dragons. Based on Asian dragons. The oriental dragons are the dragons used in such settings. They generally have close ties to nature. Like forests. The skies. The seas. Or carp notable is that the gold dragon. The first metallic dragon. Was stylized as such a dragon. But was changed to a more traditional western design, although they did retain their bitchin moustache of barbels, also known as lung dragons. Pathfinder calls them imperial dragons. Dragonets, miniature dragons more suitable for familiars or high fantasy worlds, featured in advanced dungeons and dragons. Epic dragons, introduced in the epic level handbook. Epic dragons are much larger and more powerful than regular dragons. They are usually neutral aligned but have more variation in alignment than other kinds of dragons. The first two kinds of epic dragons, force dragons and prismatic dragons, were introduced in the epic level handbook. A third type called time dragons were introduced in dragon magazine. Linorms. Nordic themed dragons who possess wingless serpentine bodies with only a set of forelimbs. Usually described as being even nastier and crueler than chromatics. Song dragons, originally called Wiredrigons, an all female race of dragons who use their ability to assume human form to interact with mortal races and find mortal spouses. Wyverns, dim witted, feral. More bestial dragons who lack a breath weapon, have wings instead of forelimbs, and a poisonous stinger. Undead dragons. Various kinds of undead dragon have appeared throughout editions. From the famous Draculich to less famous zombie, skeletal and vampire dragons. Shadow dragons. Depending on edition, either a dragon with some elemental affinity to darkness, a planar dragon, or an undead dragon. There's also a great medley of setting unique dragons such as those native to Mystera and Dragonlands. Finally, there are the Dragon Gods, a loose pantheon of deities unique to D&D dragons that hasn't traditionally gotten a lot of attention because, well, they only really give a fuck about dragons and dragons don't usually get too religious. They don't like acknowledging something as being bigger than them. The advent of the Dragonborn as a PC race is likely to change this. However, Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy commonly features dragons as bosses and powerful late game enemies though that is typically the extent of their role in the game story. With the exception Final Fantasy XIV. In this game dragons are aliens who reproduce asexually. They immortal unless their eyes are destroyed and they change shape depending on their environment. There are no set rules for what the dragons look like aside from having some type of reptilian appearance, with some looking exactly like dinosaurs. The main dragon of note in the series is recurring summon named Bahamut, a reference to Bahamut in D&D, who is always among the strongest summons in whatever game where you can use him which means you generally have to fight him to get him. Bahamut's design varies from game to game though he's always a biped western style dragon. Rather than breathing fire, he causes a big explosion. FF14 gave him an expanded role where he's actually a villain, 
and also served as a plot device who allowed for the game to be revamped due to him ravaging the world. Aside from Bahamut there is a recurring dragon made of crystal named Shinra who has the snake-like body of a eastern dragon. But the overall beast-like features of a western one on top of having wings. In remakes of the 2D games Shinra who pops up as a recurring superbus. That is a boss who is more powerful than the final boss. Shinra has the interesting distinction of appearing as the main villain in Final Fantasy's crossover fighting series Dissidia where he orchestrates a war between two gods and his power dwarfs both of them. Nothing is explained about his origin between his debut in Final Fantasy V saying that along with a machine called Omega. Shiniru was sealed in an interdimensional rift because there was no known way to defeat him. Pokemon. Dragons of one of the 18 Pokemon types. Dragon type Pokemon among the rarest types of Pokemon and fittingly are among the strongest. While they are weak to moves of certain types, their high stats and impressive mova pools mean they can easily counter types they are supposed to be weak against. To the point where the generation 6 games introduced the fairy type, which is immune to damage from dragon type attacks, to balance them. Even then there are still dragon pokemon that can effectively counter fairy types, especially since some dragons are part steel which removes their weakness to fairy attacks. The appearance of dragon pokemon varies considerably ranging from your traditional western dragons, eastern, and designs that are more esoteric. If you want to see these dragons, Bulbapedia is a thing that exists. Magic. The Gathering. Dragons in Magic the Gathering are mostly creatures associated with red, though they have appeared with other colors. They have appeared across many planes, mostly taking the traditional western dragon appearance though some have a few twists to fit with the planes theme. All the dragons are descended from an entity called the Ur Dragon, with the oldest and most powerful being the Elder Dragons, most of whom killed each other in a war with only two. Eugene and Nicol Bolas. One of the planes with the more unique dragons is Tarkit, where they are born out of elemental storms created by Eugene. Originally Eugene was killed by Bolas, causing an end to the storms and the dragons being wiped out since they stopped reproducing. When Sark and Vol changed history and prevented Eugene's death, the storms continued and the numbers of the dragons kept increasing and the five dragon lords each leading broods of other dragons to become the dominant force on the plane. Another the dragon of note named Nave Mizzet leads the Azit League on Ravnica. He is a super genius who thinks very highly of himself. He did name his guild after himself after all. He's a combination of red and blue so he's displayed magic associated with both colors. Shadowrun. Dragons from Shadowrun come in four types depending on where they originate from. Western dragons. European and North American. Eastern dragons. Asian. Feathered serpents. South American and African and sea dragons, any of the oceans. Despite morphological differences between the different breeds, they all can interbreed, and all share the mentality of highly intelligent, manipulative, avaricious doucher bags, with a few high profile exceptions. In their natural forms, dragons cannot speak verbally but instead use telepathy, which cannot be recorded. Most dragons of significance in the setting have meta-human voices who relay their words for them in telecommunication or recorded interviews. In D&D Descended settings, being a corrupt, amoral, greedy entity that forces less privileged beings to worship them would make them glorified, if terrifying, bandits at best. In the gritty cyberpunk society of Shadoran, Dragons can do all of this within the margins of a legitimized and prosperous career, intermingling with meta-human society on the boards of megacorps and in seats of power in the few polities that matter. Although they like to use these newfound levers of power that the mortals built up, they also conform to a draconic culture that exists beside, or more accurately, outside, meta-human society. Draconic society also has a loose hierarchy. The great dragons reside at the top, sometimes duking it out and sometimes working with one another as they pursue individual agendas, and the lesser dragons doing their own thing are left alone, as long as they don't step on the greater's toes and occasionally take orders. What separates the greater dragons from the rest isn't entirely understood. While there's a strong correlation with power and age separating the greats from the rest, considering the ways they think, 
what makes a great isn't quite so crude. Also due to the gritty cyberpunk setting, dragons aren't entirely good or evil, but exist more along a morally ambiguous spectrum. Unlike D&D, where the dragons are separated into the various flavor of evil chromatics and good metallics, Shadoran dragons are all individuals with their own motivations and ambitions and personal hopes and fears, even though they are all ancient. Alien beings who can't help but see metahumanity as mostly small and ephemeral beings, where some of them can even be considered good. They remain the biggest power players in the Shadoran setting, driving much of the conflicts and intrigue as they fight amongst each other and other powers, but also stand united in protecting the world and metahumanity from the terrors of the horrors. Some of the most notable dragons are Aiden, the only known great Sirush. A variant of the eastern dragons. He likes to appear to humanity as either a handsome man or a beautiful woman. Mostly to fuck with people. He's best known for destroying Tehran after a fatwa was declared against metahumans and the awakened. So standing up for the people who weren't normally humans means he'd probably be an okay guy if he weren't so edgy and angry all the fucking time. Currently pulling strings against the various Muslim movements in the Middle East and balancing fending off Lofwe's attempts to muscle in on his territory. A Lamace, a great western dragon, Lofwe's brother and chief rival, and would be champion of the downtrodden if he wasn't a huge fucking prick. Like to associate with populist movements like underground political scenes and terrorist organizations to get his work done, and was probably responsible for some of Lofwe's woes. Also advocated for hunting metahumans for sport. Also also had an ongoing prank war with Dunkles and where they traded a fruitcake for 37 years, mostly through Shadowrunners breaching one another's defenses. Died in 2074 in a war that tore apart a section of Italy and left 38 other adult dragons dead. Arlish, a great feathered serpent, known to travel the world to hunt down and destroy magical artifacts that pose a danger to meta-humanity. Probably pretty cool if she could let her hair down once in a while. Celadi, a Welsh great western dragon. Less concerned about power and wealth than he is with knowledge, and hence technology, and thus became CTO of Neonet. He then worked for just enough shares to pursue the avenues of research he wanted to and be left alone. Or was outmaneuvered by Machiavellian human seer Richard Villas in power please over Neonet. Depending on who you listen to, was the mentor and patron of lesser dragon Elihan. A Matrix guinea pig, which also kicked off the CFD plotline, which nobody cared about. Also sponsor of the Knights of Rage Street Gang, who serves as his agents out in the world. Dunkelson, widely and justifiably considered to have been the most gregarious and open-minded of the dragons, particularly when it came to giving meta-humanity a fair shake. The Big D was the dude, less of an oligarch and more of an eccentric. Big D didn't put all of his chips into one nation megacorp like the other dragons did, so he became a broad entrepreneur and collector. He started a public career with a late night talk show and ended up successfully running for president of the UCAS, until a car bomb killed him some 10 hours after his swearing in. The who and why is still unclear, though the consensus for those in the know is that he committed suicide making himself into a sacrifice that would rebalance the astral from the great ghost dance from some decades before. The Big D wasn't immune to draconic dickishness though. His will turned much of the established power structures on their heads and continues to influence the plot some 20 years down the line. Lothwick, going full Tsundir mode, pointed out to some folks that he wasn't such a great guy and that he was still a dragon first and foremost and his will was still enacting plots that furthered his personal goals many years after his death. Elahan, a lesser western dragon who was notable for being one of the non-greats who left a noticeable footprint on the world of Shadoran. He was the dragon equivalent of a teen who was kidnapped and experimented on by emerging futures, and Ra's subsidiary, and got a data jack installed into him making him the only known dragon with a meaningful relationship with the Matrix. Despite that this feat should be technically impossible and driving Elyahan non-specifically insane. He loved the feeling of the Matrix and became a good decker as well as the eventual president of emerging futures. By night, he hacked and decked under the Matrix handle of Cerberus 
and possibly as the Deccan Eurosis as well. Emerging Futures was sold off to Neon at a few years later, which is where he reconnected and started work again for his old mentor Seladic. It was later indicated that the insanity Ilahan experienced was dissociative personality disorder to compensate for the mind-bending contrast of being an awakened creature and also deep diving into the matrix. Ilahan flatlined in Crash 2.0. But his conscious survived as any ghost, possibly as two. One for each personality, prompting Celida to research ways into downloading a conscience into a branded meat body to restore his apprentice. Despite quite a bit of being fucked about from behind the scenes, including the entirety of the CFD plot, Eliahan was returned to his body, letting him continue to live a normal dragon life. Fewish Winge, a German Great Western dragon. When she woke up, she went on a bloody rampage that left many thousands of people dead until she was shot down by the German military. It was probably because she had a strong ecological bent, and humanity fucking with the environment drove her crazy. Probably. Probably. She later made a return appearance in the video game Shadoran, Dragonfall, where it's revealed that she survived but her physical and astral forms were separated. The player goes out to avenge her buddy and thwarts a plot to use her body to spread a biological weapon that targets dragons. Fewer Schwinge is either dead or hibernating through to the 8th world, depending on player decisions. Either way, she's not going to be seen again anytime soon. Ghost Walker a great western dragon and Big D's brother. His first act upon awakening was taking control of Denver, or technically, the FRFZ, and banning Aztlan for reasons hardcore Shadoran fans would understand. He has a thing for spirits rights, to the point where he is violently against binding or even summoning spirits within his territory. Hester B. A great western dragon from the Pacific Northwest. She first appeared to end the war between California and Titangaya, basically telling the kids to get off her lawn and go home. She cultivated a public persona of an egalitarian guardian of nature and meta-humanity, level-headed and moderate in comparison to her brethren. The great dragons felt that she was taking meta-humanity's side against her own kind and convened a trial that declared her outcast. Lothwick. A great western dragon from Germany, Lothwir is the richest person on earth. You know how counterculture people want to stick it to the man yeah, that's Lothwir. He is a man. Most of his fortune is a result of his leverage buyout and subsequent expansion of the Cedar Krupp Industrial Corporation. He lives in its headquarters in the Rhine-Ruhr Megaplex Ecology. He is probably also the power behind the throne of the Gaspari Mafia family, which controls the criminal underworld in Rhine-Ruhr. His name is known and feared worldwide, and he was the direct inspiration for the sixth world aphorism never deal with the dragon. Star Wars. In the original Star Wars movie we see the skeleton of a creature called a crate dragon on Tatany. They come in multiple subspecies, the skeleton is stated to belong to a greater crate dragon. A creature that is over a hundred meters long and resembles a western dragon. Men use the wings and it has around a dozen legs. The crate dragon is the top carnivore on Tatany, traveling through the sand like a giant worm and feeding on anything it finds. Tuscan raiders are terrified of them, with Obi-Wan scaring a group off by mimicking a crate dragon's roar. A smaller but still large subspecies called a canyon crate also exists. These resemble your standard quadrate western dragon. Since all the details on what a crate dragon looked like in canon were limited to reference books when a live one appeared in the Mandalorian. The greater crate dragon draws trays from artwork and legends the design is changed to make the dragon look more alien. Its body is covered in armor more snake-like while its head more resembles that of a shark. In source books it is confirmed to still have legs which is how it propels itself through the sand, they simply weren't visible because all we see of HT dragon is its head and neck. While this crate dragon has a mouthful of teeth, it's so big that it simply swallows prey whole. Despite their size the crate dragon actually prefers to retreat when threatened. If still attacked when corned it can spit up acid flesh melting acid akin to how a typical dragon breaths fire. The Dark Forces video game introduced to a smaller relative called a Kel dragon because it wasn't possible to depict a crate dragon at its proper size. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. 
Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for Coom Jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and D&D 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Warhammer Dragons have appeared since the beginning in Warhammer Fantasy, but they're ironically one of the most vaguely defined parts of the lore. They will ally themselves with the High Elves and be used as powerful, and in game terms, expensive. Mounts for elven lords. Aside from being intelligent, there's not much stated about them. Some dragons have also been corrupted by chaos and fight alongside the warriors of chaos. In both cases, they are made out to be among the most powerful monsters in the setting. And their stats live up to it, with only few models, including greater demons, having a chance at beating them. According to the Caledon novel and the recent revelation about Cathay, Dragons of all kind are not fond of the old ones and their creations, except elves, because they are somehow nicer than the others, blaming them for bringing chaos attention to their world, and freely terraforming their world, which it was akin the scenery of Jurassic period, many volcanoes and colder temperatures, as they pleased. Some dragons prefer to fight against the intruders, only to get fucking owned by their slant servants magic and the lizardmen's forces in their prime. Only the smarter and wiser dragons survive by fleeing and nesting in the deepest caverns or ocean. The dragons are also not fond of the dragon ogres and the fimit. It had a huge empire in ancient Norska at that time and had fought against them many times. Storm of Magic sees the return of Emperor Dragons, huge dragons that are arguably the most powerful units in the book. Emperor Dragons not allied with Chaos can also be upgraded all the way up to level 4 sorcerers, in addition to having nearly all 9s across their stat line. This does make them extremely expensive, ruling out their use in all but the highest point games. Dragons also have a connection with the vampires, the reason being their blood has the power to cure their otherwise ceaseless thirst for blood. Abhorash and Zacharias the everliving being the primary beneficiaries of this, where they defeated the beast either with straight up glorious approach or just cowardly draining their blood in their sleep. Abhorash then formed the blood dragons and tells his disciples if they want some of that sweet dragon ambrosia they have to go out and earn it themselves. Speaking of dragon slaying. It is a popular hobby in the world of Warhammer, where the reason said slayers participate in such activity is to either prove themselves, die gloriously or having the glory to kill it, the aforementioned thirst for blood as well as making it serve as a pretty sweet mountain undeath for food or just killing them for fun. Some prefer to just tame them by rearing them from an egg then riding them into battle when they are big enough. Races or factions like the Empire, Cole Francis Dragon and Elspeth von Draken's Carmine Dragon are the only example for the human. For now, the High Elves, Wood Elves, Vampire Counts, Undead Dragon, so is more of a summoning than taming. Warriors of Chaos and the Dark Elves examples of this. And with the monstrous Arcanum even the dwarfs became this with shackling shard dragons with runic collars that their ancestors taught how to make and use them as expendable giant attack dogs. Like in many settings, Warhammer has a number of different types, beyond the common emperor dragon split. Moems, ancestor race of the dragon kind. Four-legged sea serpents who answered only to the High Elves. Amanar is the greatest of them all. Caladorian dragons. Dragons that originate from Ulfin and who are de facto the original dragon breeds. Just like the Esser that look down on the younger races. The Caladorian dragons do the same towards other dragons. There are two renowned ancient dragon introduced in the Caladon novel and are considered to be the progenitor of the Caladorian dragons. Medrethnik. Kaladurai's mount and his father in Drognarakarinarian's mount. Sun Dragon, the youngest and smallest breed of high elven dragons. Moon Dragon, older and rarer than Sun Dragons. Star Dragon, the largest, 
Most powerful. Rare and eldest of all dragons. Black dragon. Dragons corrupted by dark elven magic. First of their kind was Sulek. Malekith's second dragon. First black dragon. To replace his old one. After Sulek's death, some black dragons chose to keep aiding the dark elves to adventure. Sulek was replaced by Seraphon. Malekith's third dragon. Second black dragon. Who Malekith instantly favored because of her ruthless action of destroying the eggs around her after hatching. Sea dragon. Corrupted dragons which have grown so large they can no longer fly. The dark elves now use them to tow their massive ships. This also pisses off the ancient sea demigod Triton who hates the dark elves for using the sea dragons as glorified sea donkeys. Forest dragon. Dragons that have adapted to live in the deep forests. So long that they will now link to the Athol lore in itself, and fight whenever the forest will. In Total War, Warhammer, its appearance compared to other dragons is more leaning towards the forested lives, antlers growing on its head, butterfly pattern on its wing and leaves, vines growing on its body as a proof of its connection with the forest. Venom Dragon, a forest dragon on steroids. They are so oversaturated with poisons and toxins that even touching any body part or organ will end up fatally for the one touching them. Those venom dragons that can cast magic are naturally attuned to the winds of Giron. Shard Dragon, wingless serpentine dragons that adapted to the deep places of the world. They would attack everything they met no matter how harmless or dangerous it is and pursue it with a stubbornness only a dwarf with a massive grudge would match. Dwarf miners often encountered and awoke these arseholes slumber and were met with predictable result. Also a shit tons of grudge if there were survivors. Same goes when a shard dragon looks for food and somehow gets into contact with a dwarf hold, goblin cave or a skaven burrow, and the results are also predictable with the addition of massive collateral damage. Only the most skilled rune lord would put a rune collar on them and send them to battle like how the lizardman done to the dread saurian, making them the only monster option for the dwarfs. Rune golems and rune guardians are constructs so they do not count as monsters. Knowing the dwarfs however, a few long beards might get off their chair and start to bitching about the dishonorable and repugnant idea of bringing monster onto the battlefield. Whereas a proper doi could just plant their trustworthy axe onto their wazak's face. Then again, since their eldest ancestors came up with shackling shard dragons, then any doi wouldn't say no to it because you don't argue with your ancestors. Not to mention that the collar completely eliminates the unpredictability factor and using them as expendable living weapons would be seen as a creative way of settling grudges. Biologically, they have razor sharp spike scales. Kinda like a resorden. But their spikes are many and thin like an animal fur that would cover their entire body. Not to mention the scales becoming as hard as Gromley with age as some dwarfs discovered. Have a venom that is both corrosive and poisonous. A breathe that causes hallucinations so horrifying that everyone dies from heart attacks and fights in absolute frenzy. Even more so if they get wounded. On top of having the same magical protection dwarfs have thanks to the runic collars. They also look like a black ferret. Nicknamed. Murder ferret. Chaos dragon. Dragons perverted by the ruinous powers. Typically Tsinch. No two are said to be alike. But they tend to have two heads. Galroch is said to be the first chaos dragon. A high elf dragon possessed by a lord of change. It wreck people's shit while earning hundreds of dwarven grudges on the Damas Kron. Egrim Van Horstman has a chaos dragon called Bordrus. Frost Whim, a subspecies of chaos dragon that appeared in the first Total War. Warhammer game with its final DLC that made Norska a playable faction. Lowwise it is speculated that Frost Whims used to be ice dragons that mutated over time by chaos. Warpfire Dragon. A mutant dragon that almost exclusively feeds on warp stone. Has a devastating breathe attack yet at the same time it's limited to the northern polar caps of the Warhammer world. So people luckily will rarely see this monstrosity. Skaven understandingly hate those things because burrows to the northern part of the world were always attacked by hungry warp fire dragons who did literally everything to break into a clan's warp stone reserve. Carmine Dragon. Dragons that are born tied to the amethyst winds of death magic. Shish. Elspeth von Drake being the only known person in both the Empire and the Warhammer world to have one as a mount so far. 
Nightmare Dragon, said to not be true dragons but the winds of Shyish given life and form. These creatures have a breathe attack similar to that of black dragons yet far more potent. The most famous one of them is Ondra the Dreaded, a giant of a dragon that was gravely wounded by a massive combined force of chaos dwarfs warriors of chaos and other chaos monstrosities. However it came at a terribly high price and she simply slid back into her lair to heal. Toad Dragon. Giant lumbering reptilian horrors with insatiable appetites and a frog-like tonge. Often serves Nurgle worshippers. Tamurk had owned a toad dragon named Bubebulus and it was the most well known and the greatest of its kind. Zombie Dragon. Basically dead dragons raised by vampires to become their mount. Fire Dragon. A hot-blooded, short-tempered dragon species, rarely seen and are synonymous with flaming destruction. Doomfire Dragon, even more hot-blooded and short-tempered than fire dragons, love to set whole cities on fire and are a whole species of pyromaniac arsonists, are heavily attuned to the winds of action those that can use magic can cast lore of fire spells. The most famous Doomfire Dragon was Malathrax the Mighty who was personally slain by Marcus Walfurt. Magma Dragon, the single most evilest of dragons and arguably far more powerful than even the Star Dragon, a obsidian black and shiny monstrous dragon with a ton of malevolence and bad temper. Its breathe attack isn't just a normal flaming breathe. But it mixes in sulfur and poison to further weaken its prey in a most painful manner. Game wise, every successful wound resulted in the model losing a point in toughness, which would stack if the dragon managed to wound the model multiple consecutive times. Only known to live in Nagareth's Black Spine Mountains and among the volcanic ranges of the Darklands. Needless to say, the Chaos Dwarfs have a lot of relations with the Magma Dragons, especially with the case of the eldest of them, Hadga. Once a simple fire dragon, Hadga was taken captive by the Chaos Dwarfs and experimented on by them with demonic possession techniques that would be used to create their trademark Kadai. This turned him into a Magma Dragon who eventually broke his chains and exacted a disproportionate retribution on the Chaos Stunties. Not only most of the Tower of Gorgoth was obliterated by the dragon, but everything around it too, especially the multitude of slave camps. These days Hadga comes out of his lair near Gorgoth to either beat some wannabe challenger or to answer the summons of powerful wizards. The door is air that observe from very afar note that parts of his scales turn to stone, meaning that with his transformation he inherited the same deadly curse that turns the sorcerer prophets into stone statues. Frost Dragon. A rare dragon species that is ice and winter incarnate with a freezing breathe. Due to its nature it's very slow to anger actually. Lives exclusively in the mountains of Morn. While certainly powerful, it will avoid adult bull mammoths or stampeding rhinoxes. Ice dragons, even rarer than frost dragons. But in this case adult bull mammoths and rhinox stampedes don't make it chicken out. They are all frostbite. Just like the frost dragons. It has a freezing breathe. Unlike frost dragons, this breathe attack is significantly more powerful. The two most famous ice dragons are Jorgal and Amurdrak. The former being slain personally by Greasus Goldtooth while the latter freezing a whole Logar tribe with a single blast of his freezing breathe. For some reason they are attuned to the winds of Hish. Meaning those that can use magic can cast lore of light spells. The frost whims may be their chaos mutated cousins. The imperial dragon. The empire's only own dragon. Elspeth dragon does not count. It was taken from the deepest cave of the black mountain. Only Colfrance can ride it in battle. Otherwise. It just sits in the Imperial Zoo of Altdorf whenever Karl rides Deathclaw to battle. It is also nameless. The poor dragon just can't be any more popular than Deathclaw how on the other hand it did get some piece of the action when during the end times it slew the Bray Shaman known as the Harbinger and its horde of beastmen and the Altdorf palace with its fiery breathe. Catherine Dragon. Like the real life Eastern Dragons. They are serpent-like and have the ability to cast magic and transform into smaller humanoid forms. The word is overused within the Cathay roster as if they were space wolves. They also rules Cathay. Although they were mysterious in the past due to the lack of Cathay fluff, the recent revelations from Total War, Warhammer and the Warhammer, the old world has revealed that there are only seven of them ruling that damn place there's the original granddaddy dragon emperor who is said to be about as strong 
if not stronger than a fucking old world god like Ulrich, and the newly addition of his wife, an equally powerful dragon moon empress. The said power couples has 9 children with the same dragon abilities defending the borders of Cathay, with only 4 missing. In the older fluff, these dragon are awesome at being magic casters, especially Law Heaven. So awesome that they fucked up the ogre tribes living north, created the Great Moor, and sunk a dark elf black arc. That said power is still true in recent canon. For the Law of Heaven, Akarazir is the Dragon Emperor's most favored lore of magic. It is also known that the offspring of the Dragon Emperor are able to have intercourse with humans which results in many citizens in Cathay sharing their blood. Dragon blooded Shu Jengen Lord, sons and daughters of the Dragon Children. They are half dragon, half man commander who are like vampire lords. Akka, good at doing everything, be it fighting, casting magic or leading an army or all three all together. With these kind of special snowflake privileges, they grow up into becoming spoiled, arrogant asses, probably more so than a typical elf, but less than Cetra, due to their superior physiology. As a result, many mortal commanders resent them with jealousy, and yet are unable to do anything to them due to their noble birthright. Age of Sigma In Age of Sigma, there are still dragons, albeit with a lesser variety. Draconith. Age of Sigma's attempt at bringing back dragons. The Draconith are the progeny of the legendary dragon god Dracothan and used to populate the realms in the days before the Age of Chaos. Once Chaos became an overwhelming threat and most of the Draconith were slain, the Slan managed to hide away what few eggs they could gather into a pocket dimension and kept vigil on them. Now that Krakness, one of the mightier gods of destruction, has awakened, the Slan have finally seen progress with the Draconith and have begun unleashing them into the pens of the Sigmarines, so they can have even more fucking pets. Also look like they are straight out of Aragorn. For your information, Aragorn was not good. Their leaders are Krondis and Kaze, legendary dragons who claim to be the direct sons of Dracothan and serve as Sigma's trusted generals. Warcraft. Dragons debuted in Warcraft I as the flying attack unit for the Orcs during which they were standard western fire-breathing dragons. They are described as normally reclusive until the Orc Horde enslaved the Queen Alex Strasza, forcing her progeny to fight for them. During the Beyond the Dark Portal expansion a group of truly evil dragons under the command one wearing armor called Deathwing. Like a lot of things introduced in the first two games the lore around them was heavily redconed. Dragons are one of the oldest creatures in Azeroth granted great magical abilities by the titans that shape their world. In a reversal of their typical role, dragons in Warcraft were all originally benevolent, although their way of thinking and doing things didn't always line up with the short-term thinking of some of the mortal races. They were originally a species of proto-dragons that had wyvern-like wings which they used as forelimbs, two puny forearms and two muscular rear legs and a tail. As a gift for their assistance in defeating the most powerful proto-dragon, Galakrond. Imagine a Warhammer Gorgon but as a dragon whose breath is so bad it literally wakes the dead. During the ordering of Azeroth the titans altered them to be the larger and more intelligent four-legged dragons. They are segregated into five types called dragon flights each with different roles and abilities bestowed to them by one of the five titans. Each dragon flight was assigned by a titan to protect some aspect of their work on Azeroth while they went off to do titan stuff elsewhere in the universe. The leader of a dragon flight is called an aspect and some dragonflights still have their original aspects. Red Dragonflight, led by Alex Trasa the Life Binder. Red dragons are fierce guardians of life. They were also given a degree of dominion over the other dragonflights. They breath fire. Blue Dragonflight, originally led by Malegus, and later by Kalekgus. Their domain is the aspect of magic. The blue dragonflight is said to be the least populous flight. They have ice breath. Green dragonflight, aspects of nature who have a strong bond to a realm called the Emerald Dream. Said to be the most populous dragonflight, though most rarely venture out of the dream. Led by Isra the Dreamer, they breath poison nightmare dragons. Green dragons and their allies which have been twisted by a corruption in the Emerald Dream called the Emerald Nightmare. They now embody the negative aspects of nature such as decay and rot, 
and serve the old gods. Bronze Dragon Flight tasked with watching over time and making sure nobody messes with the timeline. Bronze dragons are patient and reclusive, led by Nosdormu the timeless. They breath lightning. Infinite dragon flight. Bronze dragons who go rogue. They intentionally attempt to sabotage history to prevent past calamities. Led by future Nosdormu when he finally goes batshit insane due to seeing all the cataclysms well in advance and not being able to prevent them. His current time self is perfectly aware that will eventually happen to him. It was part of the deal making him the guardian of time to reveal his eventual end to him. But there's nothing he can do about that either Black Dragon Flight. Originally aspects of Earth tasked with keeping watch of the deep places. Which backfired horribly. Because that's where the old gods hang out originally led by Nilferi and the Earth Warder. Later known as Deathwing. He fell to evil and the rest of his flight followed suit. Now they are all treacherous assholes and nobody likes them they and take every possible opportunity to kill them, thus they have been hunted nearly to extinction. There are two non-evil black dragons whose minds were freed from the malicious influence of the old gods before they were hatched thanks to titan artifacts. Ibition, also known as Ebon Horn. A spirit walker of the High Mountain tribe. And Rathen, the supposed heir of Deathwing who has taken it upon himself to make sure Azeroth doesn't get fucked. These dragons breath yet of lava. Chromatic Dragon Flight. A dragon flight created by Nefarian. One of the most prominent black dragons. Through gruesome experiments. Combining the features and abilities of all five flights. Almost every one of these creations were unstable. Deformed. Infertile and or short-lived, with a single exception. Chromatus, a five-headed dragon who could only be stopped by the combined efforts of the aspects, excluding Deathwing. Twilight Dragon Flight, originally created by Syntheria Sinestra. The Twilight Dragon Flight suffered from similar problems to Nefarian's chromatic dragons. That is, until Deathwing came along and combined the efforts of both to perfect the Twilight Dragons. Successfully creating a powerful breed of dragons that feed vampirically on all forms for energy. The Twilight Dragon Flight was nearly driven to extinction following the Cataclysm. Things turn bad for the Dragon Flights when the Black Dragon aspect Niltherian was corrupted by the old gods who were imprisoned by the Titans deep within Azeroth. He plotted to destroy Azeroth to release his new masters when the Burning Legion, an army of demonic invaders led by the fallen Titan Sargeras, began to attack Azeroth. With their world under siege, Niltherian tricked the other four dragons into lending their powers to the dragon soul, a powerful artifact of his design, only to betray them and use it against them slaying many dragons. This treachery caused the other dragons to go into hiding away from each other, and although Niltherian, who had now assumed the name Deathwing, was eventually defeated, the world was twice shattered by cataclysms and the dragon soul would resurface periodically throughout history to pain the dragon flight until its eventual destruction, which drained the flights of much of their powers, turned them mortal and made them sterile, putting the five dragon flights on the extinction clock. Additionally, there exist other dragons that didn't ascend alongside the five main flights but still share a similar physique and level of intelligence. An example of such is the Storm Dragons of Stormheim, and the supposed existence of a violet dragon flight of proto-drakes. War Machine. The creatures called dragons in the Iron Kingdoms look nothing like dragons in other worlds. Rather than winged serpentine creatures of majesty and power, the dragons of Cain are monstrosities of inconsistent form and not of this world, capable of altering the bodies and minds of other creatures in horrific ways with an exotic energy they constantly emit. An energy the people of this world simply call blight. The only thing known about their origin is that the gods did not create them. They are immortal as long as their Athank, a kind of heartstone, is not destroyed. A dragon reproduces by chipping off a piece of its Athank and letting it generate a new body, but such offspring have an innate urge to recombine their Athanks and control all the power within them. Between their ability to regenerate from any amount of damage and their Athank being next to impossible to destroy, Dragons are nigh unkillable. While the residents of Cain have sometimes managed to defeat a dragon in combat the only known way for one to die is another dragon consumes their Athank. There are two dragons of significance in Cain. 
Dragon Lord Torok, god and master of the Crix faction and father to the other known dragons. He created the other dragons so he could have servants in his image. They prove to be a bit too much like him and he's been plotting to kill them ever since. Torok is the most powerful known entity on Kane. The only thing keeping him in check is because the other dragons are so afraid of him that they have a deal to set aside their differences if Torok starts acting up. As such Torok has been working to create an undead from the inhabitants of Kane to help kill the other dragons and consume their Athank. Only getting his hands dirty if he has no other options. Everblight. A shard of Torak that went off and did its own thing with elves and mutations, eventually taking a page from his old man's book by creating his eponymous faction to help kill the other dragons. Everblight is the smallest of the dragons in Cain. So much so that in order to hide from his enemies he shows his not to regenerate his body and simply hides as an athlanx since none of his enemies expect it. Thus far he's succeeded in killing two of other dragons. UGO. Dragons are one of the types of monsters in Yugon and likely its most popular. Since the franchise's iconic blue eyes white dragon was the first boss monster. Dragons tend to have very high attack points on top of some strong effects. As a rule the animes have the rival to the hero who uses a dragon type monster as their signature card. Many archetypes have dragons as their strongest monster, and many archetypes are built around dragons entirely. UGR's dragons tend to be bipedal western style in appearance, with a few exceptions. Aside from that their traits can include most anything, such being made of fire, made of ice, being part plant, or being mechanical while still being considered dragons as opposed to machine type monsters. There is even an archetype of dragon monsters who take the form of cute anime maids. Monster girls. Dragons are large, dangerous, majestic and exotic creatures. So of course people want to fuck them. Dragons, in their normal form or a more human form are of the scaly subgroup of furries. Furries attracted to things with scales instead of fur. They have a minor reputation of being that guy amongst the furries because they have to be so special and fuck mythological creatures instead of dogs. Cats, horses, foxes, rabbits and birds like normal people. While dragons in a humanoid shape, that is, dragonborn, are enjoyed by quite a few people. A large number prefer dragons in their natural shapes. For them it's about the contrast between the large and powerful dragon and their small and fragile frame. The fear makes their boners strong. There's also the perverts who want their dragons to have non-human genitals. Which is a concept that the infamous bad dragon company has capitalized on by selling their infamous dragon dildos which are often used as the punchline of a joke. One of the things that dragons in D&D are infamous for is their ability to breed with just about any creature and not being shy about it. Just take a look at for instance the song Dragons. Only constructs and undead can't reproduce with them. And even then it's possible to build or raise a dragon from the dead. This means that you can encounter anything from draconic unicorns and albus to draconic plants, slimes, aberrations and far worse. Or better, depending on your perspective. Portraying non-morphic, that is, no breasts. Female dragons on TG in a semi-erotic light is a real act that stirs contention. On the one hand, this is a well-known part of the furry fandom. On the other hand, dragons are iconic fantasy creatures. Plus, in Dungeons and Dragons, it's canon that many dragons like to get them some non-draconic loving. With their two patron creator gods Shyamat and Bahamut first in line to nab themselves some quality mortal ass on a regular fashion and setting the example for their progeny. And that's when said progeny hasn't evolved to breed with humanoids in the first place. See aforementioned song dragons. So people will fight bitterly whenever they pop up in a thread. You can guarantee. Naturally. The idea of dragons are sexy was quickly taken up by the Monster Generals crowd. In fact, one of the earliest Eki of us to make it into America was Dragon Half, in which the main character was the half-dragon daughter of a female dragon and a male human, her father being sent to slay the dragon and forgetting the S while underway. Pink appeared as a cute girl with dinky little dragon wings, cute horns, a tail and the ability to breathe fire. In fact, Pink has actually come to be the defining archetype for the dragon girl in MG fandoms. A human girl with horns, wings, a tail and, optionally, scales on the limbs. 
sometimes with paw-like feet, digitigrade legs, or even paw-like hands. It helps that this tends to be pretty accurate to D&D's own depiction of half-dragon humanoids, up to the social maladjustment of having such weird parents. Played for laughs in the manga. As with any beast girl, dragon girls with full body scales or weirdly colored skin are contentious because, no matter how human their face, they may look too furry for some purists to accept. Dragon girls are very popular in Japanese fantasy media, especially video games. Final Fantasy even has a race, the Drea, who are an entire species of cute dragon girls native to Ivalis. Strangely, despite the existence of more player-friendly dragon races like Dragonborn, Draean spell scales, the latter of whom are even supposed to have evolved from half-dragon sorcerers, the idea of reskinning these races to present them as dragon girls never really gets mentioned. This likely has something to do with the fact that these races are less powerful than the half dragon, and the standard I want to be a dragon girl player DM also wants to have all of the draconic powers, breath weapon, damage reduction, and flight. Monster Girl Encyclopedia. Naturally, the Monster Girl Encyclopedia has its share of dragon themed monster girls. The actual dragon fits the same kind of style first seen on the settings lizard girl. Scaly limbs, paw like hands and feet, a tail, fin like ears, horns and wings. They are characterized by their extreme pride, whilst not quite sunned ears, they are determined to give themselves only to the best possible man. This pride and arrogance however can reach heights that leave them unable to find a husband that either they could tolerate or any man that could tolerate them. Thus leading to, in a terrible irony, if a dragon fails to find a husband before she dies, the dark energies permeating the world will heed her unspoken desires and regrets over dying alone and reanimate her as a dragon zombie, a corpse colored, blue gray skin, dark mold green wings, white hair, dragon with bony scales. In this state, her mind has degenerated, leaving her a horny bimbo obsessed with finding a man and taking him as her mate. These dragon girls are quite dangerous, because they possess a rotten breath attack that can convert human women into undead monster girls. The wyvern is a dragon girl with a more harpy-like body structure, having wings instead of arms. These monster girls are far more friendly and easygoing than the standard dragons and readily team up with human adventurers to train with them as dragoons. Needless to say, this training is merely a more adventurous form of courtship as all dragoons end up married to their mounts. The worm is a linorm style dragon girl, essentially a massively strong lamia with paw like hands, with an extremely lustful, aggressive personality that sees them going out and chasing after a man. They are however rather dim witted, a little dopey, and easy going, well after the fact compared to the other dragon types which has its own waifu appeal despite their arguable status as dragons. The Jabberwock is a lewd, lascivious, depraved dragon girl from the Wonderland region. It can be distinguished by its dark red colors and the presence of two tentacles, each of which bears a slavering more and lecherous tongue used to pleasure victims and guzzle seamen. Unlike regular dragons, Jabberwocks are extremely direct in their affections and do not pride themselves on being powerful or their draconic superiority. Instead they pride themselves on being sexy and being able to overpower a man in a sexual manner. If they like you, and they want you, then things will be happening either the easy way or the hard way. Finally, there are the two dragons of Zapangu. The Ryu is another Lamia-like dragon, but this time based on the eastern dragons of myth rather than the western myths. A gentle-natured and benevolent Mamono with the power to influence the weather, in particular rainy weather. The Otterheim is an aquatic dragon girl princess of the deeps who resembles a mermaid with the body of a seahorse. Long story, seahorses are believed by the Japanese to be connected to dragons, and clawed hands, who seduces men to join her in her life of eternal partying in her palace under the sea. Have no fear from her seahorse appearance. Though, pedophilia and rape aside, the MGE is far too vanilla to allow explicitly advertised pegging as part of its setting. Never mind male pregnancy, which not even heterodox fanons dare to touch.